the president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. Oh, my goodness. Former Trump White House aide Cassidy Hutchinson dropped bombshell after bombshell during the January 6th committee hearing, and I have some amazing clips. Now, at the end of this video, after the last clip, I will show you the potential legal implications for Donald Trump, but uh, let's get to it because there's a lot to get to. And before I show you the first clip, there are some you know, offhand references here that I want you to understand what they mean. So mags, if you hear mags, that means the metal detectors at the uh, the speech for Donald Trump on January 6th. Pat means the White House or his White House counsel, Pat Cifalone. And Mark, of course, is Mark Meadows, Trump's chief of staff. So let's get to the first clip here where Trump was bothered by his crowd size <laughs> again at this speech on January 6th and uh, what he said about it. He was very concerned about the shot, meaning the photograph that we would get because the rally space wasn't full. Um, one of the reasons, which I've previously stated, was because he wanted it to be full and for people to not feel excluded because they'd come far to watch him at the rally. Um, and he felt the mags were at fault for not letting everybody in. But another leading reason, and likely the primary reason, is because he wanted it full and he was angry at that we weren't letting people through the mags with weapons, what the Secret Service deems as weapons and are, are weapons. <laughs> but when we were in the offstage announced tent, I was part of a conversation. I was, in the, I was in the vicinity of a conversation where I overheard the president say something to the effect of, you know, I, I don't effing care that they have weapons. They're not here to hurt me. Take the effing mags away. Let my people in. They can march to the Capitol from here. Let the people in. Take the effing mags away. Well, how about that? And I will get to, again, the potential legal implication of that at the end of this video. But, my God, Trump, of course. Now, look, these are bombshells. But also, knowing Trump, knowing who he is, none of this is really surprising. So, everything discussed here that you know, that, that Hutchinson here is going to discuss, none of it is surprising knowing who Donald Trump is, knowing how weak, how insecure the man is. So again, about the crowd size, and here he is openly saying, I don't care if they have weapons, let them come in and they're going to, and then I'm going to walk, I'm going to march in the Capitol with them, which by the way, is another clip I will get to. And <laughs> wow, uh, all the stuff around that was also incredible, as you'll see. But before I even get to anything else quickly here, you know, of course, the GOP came out, House Judiciary GOP here saying, it's literally all hearsay evidence. What a joke. And an attorney came back and clarified, saying, one, she's testifying to conversations in which she participated in, so not hearsay. Two, party admissions are no, uh, are, an ex uh, are an exception to hearsay. And three, she's testifying under oath and under penalty of perjury. You're just whining under neither. And... Uh, let me quickly show you the reaction here from uh, Fox News. This is after some of the, uh, you know, bombshells hit. Here is Brett Baer, and even they cannot hide the reality of this testimony. The bottom line, though, is this, this testimony is... Uh stunning and we're going to likely hear from the former president and his reaction to all of this in one way or another uh, but you also have other officials uh, pat cipolloni white house uh, counsel you have uh, others who are weighing in here uh, behind the scenes through her testimony uh, and uh, listen i think this it does move the ball in this uh, in this hearing even Fox News forced to acknowledge that this testimony does, in fact, move the ball, as they say. And I'll show you a lot more clips showing even more ball moving. But uh, here first, quickly on uh, on Truth Social, Trump apparently threw a tantrum about uh, Cassidy Hutchinson's testimony, describing her handwriting as that of a wacko. <laughs> so, you know when Trump throws a tantrum like this, that the shit's real. And there's no escaping it. He's doing whatever he can to try and, you know, change the narrative. Not on Twitter. He can't do it on Twitter. But he's doing it to his small group of uh, 
followers on Truth Social, people that already support him probably aren't even watching this. There's no reason for him to really be on there discussing any of it. But he needs a place to lash out, and that's what he did. Now let's get to the uh, next clip here. And this is around the language of Trump's speech and how they were careful to not implicate Trump legally. Were you aware of concerns that White House counsel Pat Cipollone or Eric Hirschman had about the language President Trump used in his ellipse speech? There were many discussions the morning of the 6th about the rhetoric of the speech that day. In my conversations with Mr. Hirschman, he had relayed that we would be foolish to include language that had been included at the president's request, which had lines along to the effect of fight for Trump, we're going to march to the Capitol, I'll be there with you, fight for me, fight for what we're doing, fight for the movement. Um, things about the vice president at the time, too. Both Mr. Hirschman and White House Counsel's Office were urging the speechwriters to not include that language for legal concerns and also for the op optics of what it could portray the president wanting to do that day. All right, so one of the common themes throughout this testimony was that Trump was saved again and again by the people around him, be it the White House legal counsel, be it uh, his security de detail, which I will get to. That story is incredible. But he could have implicated himself even further if he actually did what he was allowed to do in his speech and then after the speech he wanted to march in the Capitol. If he was allowed to do these things, as he wanted to do, it would have clearly <laughs> been even worse for Trump. I mean, it's already bad for him, but it clearly would have been even worse and the people around him saved him, even though he was lashing out at them while they were saving him. Now, let's get to the next... Uh, clip where this is about um, his legal counsel being concerned about Trump joining the march. And we understand, Ms. Hutchinson, that you also spoke to Mr. Cipollone on the morning of the 6th as you were about to go to the rally on the ellipse. And Mr. Cipollone said something to you like, make sure the movement to the Capitol does not happen. Is that correct? That's correct. I saw Mr. Cipollone right before I walked out onto West Exec that morning. And Mr. Cipollone said something to the effect of, please make sure we don't go up to the Capitol, Cassidy. Keep in touch with me. We're going to get charged with every crime imaginable if we make that movement happen. And do you remember which crimes Mr. Cipollone was concerned with? In the days leading up to the six, we had conversations about potentially obstructing justice or defrauding the electoral account. He was also worried that it would look like we were inciting a riot or encouraging a riot to erupt on the Capitol, at the Capitol. So keep in mind, these conversations here were happening before January 6th, meaning they knew that a riot was going to happen and did not want Trump there as it would clearly legally implicate him directly in what was going on. So they were fully aware of what was about to go down on January 6th. Now, this is where we get to this amazing story. So this is what Trump tried to do after his speech. When he was in his motorcade, you're going to hear the word uh, the beast. The beast is Trump's motorcade. So this is, a, this is Hutchinson discussing a conversation with Trump's White House aide, Tony Ornato, and Trump's security de detail following Trump's speech. Tony proceeded to tell me that... When the president got in the beast, he was under the impression from Mr. Meadows that the off-the-record movement to the Capitol was still possible and likely to happen, but that Bobby had more information. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol, and when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it, it's not secure, we're going back to the West Wing, the president had very strong, a very angry response to that. Um, Tony described him as being irate. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. The president reached up towards the front of the vehicle to grab at the steering wheel. Mr. Engel grabbed his arm, 
said, sir, you need to take your hand off the steering wheel. We're going back to the West Wing. We're not going to the Capitol. Mr. Trump then used his free hand to lunge towards Bobby Angle. And Mr. when Mr. Renato had recounted this story to me, he had motioned towards his clavicles. The physical altercation that Ms. Hutchinson described in the presidential vehicle was not the first time that the president had become very angry about issues relating to the election. No, it's not. And we'll get to another example of that shortly, but wow. He grabbed the steering wheel. Grabbed, uh, it sounds like grabbed somebody's neck or lunged at them something uh, to his, his other um, Secret Service agent there. Unfreaking believable. Now, I say that as a reaction to what happened, but knowing Trump, it's totally freaking believable. <laughs> this is who the man is. He is a child throwing a hissy fit in a car, grabbing the steering wheel, steering wheel grabbing somebody else, trying to get them to drive him to the Capitol. Again, showing you Trump's intent here. The people around him, his security detail, the Secret Service, saving him from potentially worse legal implications here. But again, someone around him saving him. Showing you what he wanted to do, what his intent here was. And again, we'll get to the legal breakdown of uh, the potential implications here at the end of this video. But let's now get to another example of Trump throwing a hissy fit. And this is Trump's about Trump's reaction to Bill Barr's interview with the AP. So Mark went down to the dining room, and came back to the office a few minutes later. After Mark had returned, I left the office and went down to the dining room and I noticed that the door was propped open and the valet was inside the dining room changing the tablecloth off of the dining room table. He motioned for me to come in and then pointed towards the front of the room near the fireplace mantle and the TV where I first noticed there was ketchup dripping down the wall and there's a shattered porcelain plate on the floor. The valet had articulated that the president was extremely angry at the Attorney General's AP interview and had thrown his lunch against the wall, um, which was causing them to have to clean up. So I, I grabbed a towel and started wiping the catch up off of the wall to help the valet out. Um, and he said something to the effect of, he's really ticked off about this. I, I would stay clear of him for right now. He, he's really, really ticked off about this right now. And Ms. Hutchinson, was this the only instance that you are aware of where the president threw dishes? It's not. And are there other instances in the dining room that you recall where he expressed his anger? There were, there were several times throughout my tenure with the chief of staff that I was aware of him either throwing dishes or flipping the tablecloth um, to let all the contents of the table go onto the floor. And, likely break or go everywhere. Just incredible. What a child. This is your strong man? This weak little bitch? <laughs> Unbelievable. So this is the story that he reacted to from December 1st, 2020, disputing Trump. Barr says no widespread election fraud. And there's another part of this, uh, this hearing where they show a clip of Barr discussing Trump's um, or Barr going in to say, hey, you want me to, you know, uh, resign here? And then Trump, like, threw his hand down on the table and said, uh, I accept your resignation. So <laughs> he's just, he is such a freaking child. He tries to control everything around him while it's all falling apart. While he lost the election, he can't accept it because he's such a weak little bitch. He can't accept the fact that he lost the election, so he has to pretend he won do all this other garbage, try to, to, to steal it on January 6th, tried to force himself to the Capitol with the marchers, with the, the rioters. Amazing. And in terms of the ketchup, I just, I, I just want to share this because I laughed. Maybe you'll laugh. But there's an account. I think it's Occupy Democrats. And I think this is a bit of a parody of them because they tweet out some ridiculous things sometimes. <laughs> but uh, this one here. Breaking. Witness Cassidy Hutchinson reveals Trump grew so irate that he threw a plate of ketchup at the wall. Retweet if you think Biden should throw mustard at the wall. <laughs> okay, sorry, I laughed. <laughs> this is, 
<laughs> if you follow Occupy Democrats, this is the kind of shit they uh, they tweet. It's it's a little ridiculous. But now, let's get to the uh, next clip here. Is this the last one? It is. This is the last clip, and then I'll summarize, and then I will show you the potential legal implications here. But uh, this one's also pretty damn good. I remember Pat saying something to the effect of, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat, he thinks Mike deserves it, he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. To which Pat said something, this is effing crazy, we need to be doing something more, briefly stepped into Mark's office. And when Mark had said something, when Mark had said something to the effect of, he doesn't think they're doing anything wrong, knowing what I had heard, briefly in the dining room, coupled with Pat discussing the hang Mike Pence chance in the lobby of our office, and then Mark's response, I understood there to be the rioters in the Capitol that were chanting for the vice president to be hung. Now, it's, <laughs> it's funny to me how little this impacted me because I thought I already maybe heard this before about Trump's position on Pence. Pence, I mean, Trump really didn't care at all about Mike Pence on that day because um, he wasn't trying to steal the election for him. But here is clear. Trump not only didn't care about the chance about Mike Pence and, and the, the crowd wanting to hang him, but also thought that Pence deserved it. And that's from Mark Meadows. All right, let's summarize and then get to the legal implications potentially from this and quickly here before I end, because there was a lot here. So also in this testimony, apparently Mark Meadows and Giuliani both sought pardons from Trump. Also, this came out showing that Trump is potentially still trying to obstruct justice if this is from Trump or a person around him, but a message to a witness, a person, probably Trump, let me know you have your deposition tomorrow. He wants me to let you know that he's thinking about you. He knows you're loyal and you're going to do the right thing when you go in for your deposition. This is some mafia Al Capone shit. But that's who, uh, that's the kind of guy Trump is. All right, legal implications here. So, Renato Mariotti, he is a, uh, let me get clear his title. I know he's an attorney, but he's a former federal prosecutor, legal analyst for TV and print. All right, and he's a columnist for Politico. All right, here is a bit of his breakdown around how this may implicate Trump. So he says here, anyone who has paid attention during the Trump presidency knows that explosive revelations don't always mean that legal consequences will follow. But Hutchinson's testimony actually moved the ball forward significantly toward a potential DOJ prosecution of Trump. We did hear some testimony today that could bolster a case against Giuliani, but what makes today's testimony different is that it included damning testimony that gives us a window into Trump's state of mind that would be admissible in court against Trump. Testimony that Trump said he didn't effing care that they have weapons, they're not here to hurt me, and that they would be going to the Capitol later is precisely the sort of smoking gun evidence needed to prove that the person speaking meant to incite imminent violence. One of the most shocking revelations by Hutchinson today was her testimony that Trump tried to grab the steering wheel when Secret Service agents refused to take him to the Capitol. Has failed attempt... To, or sorry, his failed, that's a typo, his failed attempt to go to the Capitol in itself likely wouldn't be an offense. But the wrestling the steering wheel episode would be powerful evidence of Trump's intent. Up until now, the picture that emerged of Trump was one of someone who engaged in inaction while the Capitol was under attack. In itself, that is dereliction of duty, not a crime. Hutchinson's testimony is a game changer. Until now, what I saw was potential narrow criminal charges against crooked lawyers. Now it looks like an otherwise unlikely incitement prosecution is possible, and there may be the smoking gun needed for an obstruction charge. So there you go. And by the way, this guy's being very conservative with his opinions here, because others have already said that Trump could be charged with like, you know, 10 different things by now. But Here's somebody who's being very conservative with how he's approaching this. And even he is saying that this is moving the ball forward and it now implicates Trump even further.